Section 23. Celebration of the New Year. China New Year. What a suggestive ring have these three words for the foreigner in Far Cathay. Footnote. The title of Mr. Medhurst's work. End footnote. What visions do they conjure up of ill-served tiffins, of wages forestalled, of petty thefts, and perhaps a burglary? What thoughts of horrid tom-toms and ruthless firecrackers, making day hideous as well as night? What apparitions of gaudily dressed butlers and smug-faced coolies, their rear brought up by man's natural enemy in China, the cook, for once in his life clean, and holding in approved Confucian style, footnote, in presenting his gifts, his countenance wore a placid appearance. Analix, chapter 10, end footnote. Some poisonous, indigestible present he calls a cake. New Year's Day is the one great annual event in Chinese social and political life. An imperial birthday, even an imperial marriage, pales before the important hour at which all sublunary affairs are supposed to start afresh, every account balanced and every debt paid. About ten days previously, the administration of public business is nominally suspended. Offices are closed, official seals carefully wrapped up and given into the safe keeping of His Honor's or His Excellency's wife. Footnote. A universal custom, which may be quoted with countless others against the degradation of women in China doctrine. End footnote. The holidays last one month, and during that time inaction is the order of the day, it being forbidden to punish criminals or even to stamp, and consequently to write, a dispatch on any subject whatever. The dangerous results, however, that might ensue from a too literal observance of the latter prohibitions are neatly anticipated by stamping beforehand a number of blank sheets of paper, so that, if occasion requires, a communication may be forwarded without delay and without committing an actual breach of law or custom. The new year is the season of presents. Closely packed boxes of Chinese cake, biscuits, and crystallized fruit are presented as tributes of respect to the patriarchs of the family. Grapes from Sanxi or Shantung, hams from Fuchao, and liches from Canton, all form fitting vehicles for a declaration of friendship or of love. Now, too, the birthday gifts offered by every official in the empire to his immediate superior are supplemented by further propitiatory sacrifices to the powers that be, without which tenure of office would be at once troublesome and insecure. Such are known as dry, in the contradistinction to the water presents exchanged between relatives and friends. The latter are wholly, or at any rate in part, articles of food prized among the Chinese for their delicacy or rarity, perhaps both, and so to all appearances are the baskets of choice oranges, etc., sent, for instance, by a district magistrate with compliments of the season to His Excellency the provincial judge. But the magistrate and the judge know better, for beneath that smiling fruit lie concealed certain banknotes, or shoes of silver, of unimpeachable touch, which form a unit in the sum of that functionary's income, and enable him in his turn to ingratiate himself with the all-powerful viceroy, while he lays by from year to year a comfortable provision against the time when sickness or old age may compel him to resign both the duties and privileges of government. To all between the four seas, patrician and plebeian alike, footnote, Chinese society is divided into two classes, officials and non-officials, end footnote. The new year is a period of much intensity. On the 23rd or 24th of the preceding moon, it is the duty of every family to bid farewell to the spirit of the hearth and to return thanks for the protection vouchsafed during the past year to each member of the household. The spirit is about to make his annual journey to heaven, and lest aught of the disclosures he might make should entail unpleasant consequences, it is adjudged best that he shall be rendered incapable of making any disclosures at all. With this view, quantities of a very sticky sweetmeat are prepared and presented, as it were, in sacrifice, on eating which the unwary god finds his lips tightly glued together and himself unable to utter a single syllable. Beans are also offered as fodder for the horse on which he is supposed to ride. On the last day of the old year he returns and is regaled to his heart's content on brown sugar and vegetables. That is the time par excellence for cracker firing, though, as everybody knows, these abominations begin some days previously. Everyone, however, may not be aware that the object of letting off these crackers 
is to rid the place of all evil spirits that may have collected together during the twelve months just over, so that the influences of the young may be uncontaminated by their presence. New Year's Eve is no season for sleep. In fact, Chinamen almost think it obligatory in a respectful son of Han to sit up all night. Indeed, unless his bills are paid, he would have a poor chance of sleeping even if he wished. His persevering creditor would not leave his side, but would sit there threatening and pleading by turns until he got his money or effected a compromise. Even should it be past twelve o'clock, the wretched debtor cannot call it New Year's Day until his unwelcomed dun has made it so by blowing out the candle in his lantern. Of course there are exceptions, but as a rule all accounts in China are squared up before the old year has become a matter of history and the new year reigns in its stead. Then, with the first streaks of dawn, begins the incessant round of visits, which is such a distinguishing feature of the whole proceedings. Dressed out in his very best, official hat and boots, button and peacock's feather, if lucky enough to possess them, footnote, no matter whether by merit or by purchase, end footnote, every individual Chinaman in the empire goes off to call on all his relatives and friends. With a thick wad of cards he presents himself first at the houses of the elder branches of the family, or visits the friends of his father. When all the seniors have been disposed of, he seeks out his own particular cronies, of his own age and standing. If in the service of his country, he does not omit to call at the yamen and leave some trifling souvenir of his visit for the officer immediately in authority over him. Wherever he goes, he is always offered something to eat, a fresh supply of cakes, fruit, and wine being brought in for each guest as he arrives. While thus engaged, his father, or perhaps brother, will be doing the honors at home, ready to take their turn as occasion may serve. New joy, new joy, get rich, get rich, is the equivalent of our happy new year, and is bandied about from mouth to mouth at this festive season, until petty distinctions of nationality and creed vanish before the conviction that, at least in matters of sentiment, Chinamen and Europeans meet upon common ground. Yet there is one solitary exception to the rule, an unfortunate being whom no one wishes to see prosperous, and whom nobody greets with the pleasant phrase, Get rich, get rich. It is the coffin-maker. End of section 23